Thank you so much for coming tonight. We're uh, really, really pleased to see you and excited to hear what uh, Brother Thomas has to, to uh, share with us. Just a few reminders, if you have a phone, a watch, anything that makes noise, um, please be sure to silence that. Um, this is being streamed as well as recorded. So any noise you make will get picked up by the mic. So we appreciate it if you, you can turn those things off. Um, and I think that's all. I'll just go ahead and, and start us with Father in heaven, we are thankful for so many things this evening. We're thankful for this place that allows us to gather together for the gift of music, for um, Brother Thomas and his preparation, his love of this, this music and those who have created it, um, for the beauty that it brings to our lives and for the ways we can better understand it and uh, also understand ourselves and our responses to the beauty in this, in this life. We ask you to bless him in his performance. We ask you to bless us with uh, open ears and that we may learn something and feel something tonight. And uh, that it will in some way more deeply connect us with the gospel and with our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
okay, is this on? Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Thank you so much for coming this evening and welcome to the first recital of the Nocturne Project. You can read about it in the program note, I will not bore you with the details, but uh, it's something that I've been working on since spring of 2020. We can thank the pandemic for something, I guess, uh, but it's been quite a, quite a, a journey and I've, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, you just heard Chopin's first published Nocturne written in around 1831. And uh, you may ask, by the way, here's what it looks like at the beginning. Uh, you may ask, you probably aren't asking, but if you were, you'd say, what is a nocturne? Here is our definition from the Oxford Music Online. A piece suggesting night, but hence nocturne. Usually quiet and meditative in character, but not invariably so, as we will see through the course of these recitals. There's also the Italian term notturno, which has to do with playing music outside in the 18th century at 11 o'clock at night. This is not the same thing. Um, so there's no direct connection. So, so where does this term actually come from? Well, Chopin was not the originator of this genre, even though he's the one uh, most associated with it. So there's this guy called John Field. I'm just curious, how many have heard of John Field? Okay, a few, a few students who had to do, you know, a reading, <laughs> good. <laughs> um, so he's an Irish composer, actually, and was a protege, uh, he's born in 1782. He's a protege of Museo Clementi. How many played a Santina by Clementi? Yes, okay. He was also a composer, he, or well, a pianist and a piano manufacturer, actually, and uh, John Field helped demonstrate his pianos as a teenager in London. Uh, but he actually lived most of his life in Russia, uh, starting around 1802 at age 20. Uh, and he became this very fashionable and quite wealthy piano teacher, uh, much to his uh, demise, as it turns out, because he became an alcoholic with all that money, uh, ended badly. But in the meantime, he wrote 18 nocturnes, plus a few piano sonatas, piano concertos, other pieces. But really, the main reason he's remembered is because of this invention of the nocturne. His very first nocturne is in E-flat major, and it was uh, written, uh, or published first in St. Petersburg, Russia, in 1812. Um, but he called it romance at that time. But then in 1814, uh, Peters uh, issued it and called it a nocturne. And that is the first time we see that French term in print associated with this type of piece. So it turns out that he had a fan in Franz Liszt. Franz Liszt, of course, was the great uh, virtuoso pianist and composer that everybody you know, sees as the ultimate sort of 19th century rock star. And uh, he actually published an edition of Field's first six nocturnes in 1859. And he wrote this preface where he uh, explained what, what he thought here. The title nocturne aptly applies to the pieces so named by Field, for it bears our thoughts at the outset toward those hours wherein the soul released from all the cares of the day is lost in self-contemplation and soars towards the regions of a starlit heaven, which is, I suppose, about where you are right now. You're all soaring hopefully. If you thought that was poetic, you have no idea. He, he's just getting warmed up. Um, and, and I won't read all of it, but he, he says, uh, no one but Field has revived these vague aeolian tones, these half sighs of the breezes, plaintive wailings, ecstatic moanings. Yes, that's get pretty heady. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's just the way the 19th century is, I suppose. So many have compared uh, Field's E-flat nocturne with Chopin's E flat nocturne, which is the next one I'll play, opus nine, number two. They are the same key and meter, which is 12-8. Uh, they have this bel canto melody supported by broken left hand chords. Bel canto is a term we borrow from opera of this period, uh, most is closely associated with uh, Bellini, uh, Rossini, Donizetti, uh, where you have this long, beautiful, spun out melody over a simple accompaniment. We see this in opera, and Field and Chopin both borrow from this style. We also have, uh, in both pieces, the use of a turn followed by a leap. I'm just gonna demonstrate these real quick. Oh, I forgot I had this nifty animation. I'm gonna show you here. See, there you go. <laughs> so, I just figured that out today. I'm pretty proud of that. Um, so here's what Field's turn sounds like. In Chopin, you probably recognize this. So we have that feature in common. Oh, there it is, yes. And we also have uh, a similar motivic, um, or I should say a, a melodic figure that introduces the second 
half of the piece, um, which is this little figure here in field. And Chopin. So that, that has a certain family resemblance. And we also have um, this little run with fast notes at the end, followed by sixths uh, in the right hand. A sixth is an interval, sounds like this, right? And in the case of the Chopin or the field. And then in Chopin. So that has a certain similarity. Now, uh, there are some differences, obviously. Chopin's, uh, his harmony is more chromatic. You are going to have probably what you would consider more emotional range in Chopin as a result. And at the end of this particular piece, Chopin is for sure more dramatic. Now, um, whoops, there is, whoa, what's it doing? There we go. There is also another E flat nocturne by Field, number nine or 10 or 11, depending on uh, the publisher which has this left hand accompaniment, which is very similar to what Chopin did. This was written in 1816. So left hand with the chords, we see in this one. So similarity there as well. Now you may wonder, did Chopin and Field ever like get together and like, hey, let's do a collaborative nocturne? No. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry, I forgot my, oh dang, I forgot. There they are, the left hand, okay. Um, so Chopin did meet Field in 1832, and let's just say it did not go well. Uh, <laughs> Chopin ref refers to him as dry and colorless, and Field said he's a sick room talent and a poacher. <laughs> Which is a fair point in both cases, probably, but not very kind. Uh, because, not least because uh, this E flat nocturne, the second one that I played of Fields, appeared next to Chopin's Opus 9, number two, in a compilation around 1832, and it was not favorably, uh, it was not in, in Fields' favor in terms of the public opinion, so he didn't like that. Um, anyway, that was, that was Paris 1832. Okay, um, I will now play for you these two side by side. So you'll hear first the John Field E flat nocturne number one from 1812, followed by the Opus 9 number two of Chopin, which was 1831.
I think I forgot to turn my mic off. I hope that didn't cause a problem. You, you were doing, getting rid of distortions or anything. Okay, good. Anybody like field? Field yes, field no? Yeah? It's, it's a very different language. It's much simpler, right? It's also, fifth, what is it? Earlier, um, some years earlier. I, I can't do the math. Now, I can't resist showing you this little bit. Um, uh, oh, yeah, that's no, there. I don't know if you have seen the 1995 film Sense and Sensibility, uh, an adaptation of Jane Austen's 1811 novel, which, of course, was written just a year before that, that field nocturne. There's this moment in this piece, and can we get the lights down for this a little, um, where we have, um, there we go, we have Emma Thompson and Hugh Grant having a moment listening to a piece very like the field. And this might, whoops, that's supposed to play. There we go. This might be how this sort of music was used in upper middle class society at this time. This is by Patrick Doyle, by the way. So, <laughs> you can be lights back up. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I think that was the idea. This kind of music was supposed to make you all teary. I hope it did. Um, additionally, um, I just have to say, when I was practicing that field for the first time, my, my daughter said, is that from Sense and Sensibility? <laughs> she thought it was actually the same piece. I was like, yeah, no. But she kind of alerted me to that connection, which I thought was kind of fun. Okay, so it turns out that Chopin and Field both rarely played their pieces as written. They added variants, they did all kinds of ornamentation and improvised a lot. His student, Wilhelm von Lenz, said, um, Chopin wrote, just wrote in several small but very important changes for me. His script was clean, tiny, and clear. So he's talking about the variants that he added to the, to the printed score. By the way, here's a look at Chopin's handwriting, which was really, really narrow and super, super neat. Unlike Beethoven, if you've ever seen Beethoven's scrawls, I mean, I don't know how anyone knows what he really wrote. But with Chopin, it was very, very clear and very clear. This is a piece I'll play at the end of the program, by the way. Not from that score, but anyway. Um, <laughs> so um, another student, Adolf Gutmann, uh, said he played the, re well, it is said of him that he played the return of the principal subject in a way very different, and this is speaking specifically about Opus 9, number 2, very different from that in which it is printed with a great deal of ornamentation, and said that Chopin played always in that way. Also, the cadence at the end of the nocturne had a different form. Okay, so uh, let me just play you a couple of those variants. Um, so this is the National Edition, uh, which was uh, released in about 2013, and it is the most, in my opinion, most scholarly correct kind of thing that you can get. Um, so here's, here's an example. I can't remember if I've got these in the, I think I do. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so you can see uh, in the small print there what, what the variants were that he wrote in. Here's from the beginning. Oops. Okay, or. Kind of nice, I don't know. Uh, another option we have later on, I know this is kind of a lot, but there you go. Um, so we have this uh, on the return.
So that's quite elaborate. Um, <laughs> and then we have, um, at the end, and I might, I have to advance this, I have to probably remember. We have this version at the, uh, of the conclusion that was maybe the one that Gutmann did. So much more elaborate. So I'm curious, uh, do you vote for the printed one or the elaborated one? Printed. Simpler, okay. Elaborated. Oh yeah, you guys are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's quite something. Now, I, I will say, this is something of a lost art today. I mean, you really almost never hear anybody play the variants. Uh, so even, even the authentic variants like these. Uh, the only recording I could find of that was Valentina Lasitza on YouTube. I've never seen anyone else uh, record that particular, um, these variants at all. So people stick to what's, what's uh, under, I guess, familiar. But it is kind of fun. Okay, uh, List uh, also had comments from that preface about uh, Field's ability to actually do the same thing, these variants. He said Chopin in his, uh, wait, wait, wrong one. Got the right place. No one has dared attempt them. Now maybe that's why we don't do it. No one dares, right? Uh, no one especially who hear, heard Field himself play, or rather dream his pieces, wrapped in inspiration, not limiting himself to the written notes, but incessantly inventing new groups wherewith to engarland his melodies. At each repetition, he would adorn them diversely with a flowery rain, yet they never wholly disappeared beneath an ornamentation which veiled without hiding their languishing undulations and ravishing outlines. Don't you wish you could write like that? It's kind of fun. Uh, so, so Fields did this. However, uh, we also have an interesting note from Glinka. Mikhail Glinka, the Russian composer, was actually Fields' student, believe it or not. And he said this way, it seemed that he did not strike the keys, but his very fingers poured on them like large drops of rain and were scattered like pearls on velvet, which is a term that is, is uh, somewhat, it's become kind of a catchphrase, pearls on velvet. Um, so to be fair, what sounded very naive perhaps in uh, Field's uh, early nocturne could have sounded more sophisticated, more nuanced with all these types of ornamentations. Now, no one dared except maybe Bart van Oort. Okay, so it turns out that this Dutch pianist has done an elaborated version of this nocturne. Not, um, not only that, but he's done it on an 1823 Broadwood piano. So this is a London-built piano that would have been very much contemporary with both Chopin and with uh, field, particularly field. Let's see if it will play. Nope, it won't. No, it will. You notice know, so the pitches are just a little flatter. They, they tune it a little lower. So far the same, a little extra trill there, but he's just getting warmed up. So, gives you an idea. A little nicer, maybe, would you say? Or not, I don't know. The simple one's nice, too. 
Now, what did the critics think of Chopin at this time? Uh, this is a comment from Ludwig Rellstab in uh, Berlin in 1833, uh, where <laughs> he, he did not care for Chopin versus Fields. He compares them saying this, where John Fields smiles, Chopin makes a grinning grimace. Where Fields sighs, Chopin groans. Where Fields shrugs his sh shoulders, Chopin arches his back like a cat. Where Field puts some seasoning into the food, Chopin empties a handful of cayenne pepper. In short, if one holds Field's charming romances before a distorting concave mirror so that every delicate impression becomes a coarse one, one gets Chopin's work. We implore Mr. Chopin to return to nature. <laughs> now, this uh, did not happen. <laughs> he did not return to nature. And of course, Mr. Relstab is probably looking at a more conservative tradition. Chopin was really quite progressive with his harmony. And uh, even though uh, this is only 1833, he was already kind of scaring people a little bit. So um, Chopin, uh, Liszt had a little bit more perhaps realistic view of this. This is uh, his comments 26 years later in that 1859 pref preface. Here he's comparing the two again. Chopin in his poetic nocturne saying not only the inharmonies which are the source of our most ineffable delights, but likewise the restless, agitating bewilderment to which they oft give rise. His flight is loftier, though his wing be more wounded. I love that, I think that's really poetic. <laughs> and his very suaveness grows heartrending. So thinly does it veil his despairful anguish. Their closer kinship to sorrow than those of field renders them the more strongly marked. Their poetry is more somber and fascinating. They ravish us more, but are less reposeful. And thus permit us to return with pleasure to these pearly shells, and now he's referring to field's work, these pearly shells that open far from the tempests and immensities of ocean beside some murmuring spring shaded by the palms of a happy oasis, which makes us forget even the existence of the desert. So maybe that's a fair analysis, maybe a little bit cl uh, closer to the truth. Now, we have to wonder why is Chopin a little bit different? There is a word in Polish called żal. I don't, any Polish speakers here? Okay, good. I, don't, I think that's right. Um, <laughs> But this word really is at the heart of much of Chopin's style in his composition. Um, and the definition is very difficult to, to come up with in, in English. There's not one word that really captures it, so here's a few. Uh, it's basically regret, but it is also grief, sorrow, remorse, a grudge, contrition, rancor, bitterness, compunction, soreness, dissatisfaction, dudgeon, and pique. Those are just some that I came up with, or that I found. I didn't come up with them. Yeah. But, um, and Liszt explained this really well. He said, whatever might have been his transitory pleasure, Chopin had never been free from a feeling which might almost be said to form the soil of his heart, and for which he could find no appropriate expression except in his own language, no other possessing a term equivalent to the Polish word zal, as if his ears thirsted for the sound of this word, which expresses the whole range of emotions produced by intense regret. Through all the shades of feeling, from hatred to repentance, he repeated it again and again, and then he gets a little more detailed. This is really good here, I think. Jal, it includes all the tenderness, all the humility of a regret born with resignation and without a murmur, while bowing before the fiat of necessity, the inscrutable decrees of providence, but changing its character. It signifies excitement, agitation, rancor, revolt full of, of reproach, premeditated vengeance, menace never ceasing to threaten if retaliation should become possible feeding itself, meanwhile, with this bitter, if sterile hatred. That's pretty detailed, um, <laughs> but I, I really find that very, very helpful. Here are some words by Chopin, which might uh, relate to this, this idea a little bit. This is from a letter to his friend, uh, Titus Wojciechowski. I think I said that somewhat, in anyway, most of the syllables. Um, he said this in a letter, I wish I could throw off the thoughts which poison my happiness, and yet I take a kind of pleasure in indulging them. Now, in a, a much darker time, um, in 1831, when uh, Warsaw had fallen to the Russians uh, after the, the November 1829 uprising, uh, which was about 10 months of, of bitter war, ten, tens of thousands killed, uh, Chopin had just left before that happened on a concert tour, and he never returned to Warsaw again, never returned to Poland. And so at this point, he was in Stuttgart. He was writing in a notebook or a journal, and actually the thoughts he had expressed were very dark. There were things like, why was I born? Why is anyone born? There is no purpose in anything. He's very nihilistic. 
He says this, otherwise, why was I not prevented from remaining in a world where I'm utterly useless? What good can my existence bring to anyone? But wait, wait, what's this? Tears. How long is it? How long it is since they flowed? How is this, seeing that an arid melancholy has held me for so long in its grip? How good it feels and sorrowful. Sad but kindly tears. What a strange emotion. Sad but blessed. It is not good for one to be sad, and yet how pleasant it is. A strange state. And then this, I believe, is evidence that he really did express these kinds of feelings directly into his music. Sometimes we say, well, we don't really know what the composer was thinking or whether there was a biographical event that really tied to his music. I think there was in Chopin's case. And this letter seems to support that idea. This is another letter to his friend Titus. It is dreadful when something weighs on your mind not to have a soul to unburden yourself to. You know what I mean. I tell my piano the things I used to tell you. So I'm now going to interrupt Opus 9 to play Opus 72, number 1. This was a great example of Jal, in my opinion. Uh, it was published actually in 1855, not during Chopin's lifetime, by Julian Fontana, who is uh, Chopin's schoolmate and friend. Uh, it was probably written in 1827, when Chopin was just 17 years old, if you can imagine. What were you doing at 17? Anybody? Anybody? No. Probably not writing masterpieces? OK. Um, it could have been a few years later, um, according to Jan Ecker, who, who did not believe the 1827 date. But uh, Alan Walker, the great biographer of Chopin, says uh, Chopin had the prerogative of any genius, which is to borrow from his future. If it sounded too advanced, that's probably what it was. So he had already experienced the loss at this point in 1827 of his sister Emily, who died of tuberculosis at age 14. This happened just in April. And one of his very close friends, Jan Bialoblocki, was seriously ill with the same disease and died early the next year. Chopin himself, of course, he died of the same disease in 1849. So uh, I will go ahead and play Opus 72, number one, the opus posthumous, sometimes called E Minor Nocturne.
Thank you. One of the most famous, but justly so, I think. And it's quite remarkable. It really was 17 or 18 or 19. I'd, you know, I'd say it's pretty good either way. Uh, next, we have um, the question of other aspects of opera style. Besides the Belcanto style, we also have uh, ornamentation. We, we've kind of mentioned that. But where did he get it from? So he really got this, not necessarily from the composers, but from the singers themselves. This is a letter from Emily van Gretsch to her father, one of his students. And she said that his play is entirely based on the vocal style of Rubini, Malibran, and Grisi. He said, he said so himself. These are great singers of the day. And he uh, absolutely uh, adored opera and was kind of a fanboy of a lot of these singers. And he would go to the opera in, Wa in Warsaw and uh, Paris as often as possible to um, listen to what they, had to, what they had done. Many of these composers are mentioned as influential, Bellini in particular, but really I, I think they're kind of the, the, the background compared to the singers themselves. Um, we have an example here from La Gazza Ladra, which is the Thieving Magpie by Rossini. Um, this is the opera, or the aria Di Piacer Mi Balze Il Cor, sung by Rosa Feola, who's an up and coming amazing soprano. Uh, this is her at the La Scala Opera. Um, a few years ago, and uh, here she demonstrates some of that type of ornamentation that, sh that may have inspired Chopin. Uh, some of it is written out by, by Rossini, but a lot of it is her own. So I'm going to go ahead and try to get this to go. Whoops, it always does that. There we go. And I have to scroll ahead a little. You just hear a little bit of this. Okay, that's, we'll stop there. There's a lot more. She's really quite amazing. Um, yeah, she's going on. That's, that's a diva for you. Okay, come on. <laughs> she won't stop. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, get them off the stage somehow. Okay, so uh, List, of course, had something to say about this. Um, this is kind of a long quote. I, I'll let you just read it for a second. But basically, this nocturne really has a lot more of those kinds of ornamentations that we see written out uh, by Chopin that he probably got from, from the opera. One other aspect of this, this is opus nine number three we're talking about, by the way, sorry. The next one and the last one in the opus nine set. Uh, again, written 1831, published 1832. Uh, and he uh, also wrote in the B section, or the middle section, an agitato, a very dramatic uh, minor section in contrast to the outer sections, which are quite playful. It's actually marked allegretto scherzando, which is, scherzando means jokingly or playfully. That's not something you see every day in the nocturne. Um, but you'll hear that, and it becomes a model for about a half dozen or so other nocturnes that have dramatic middle sections. So I'll go ahead and play that uh, now. Here's your little inch of it, if I remember to do that. I can turn this off this time.
All right, the last piece I'm going to play for you this evening is called Lento con gran espressione, but also sometimes known as Nocturne Number no. 20 or Nocturne Opus Posthumus in C sharp minor. You may know this piece actually from the 2002 Roman Polanski film The Pianist about Vladimir Spielmann, a real person who, uh, in the opening scene, you'll see him recording this piece in Warsaw. Uh, the day that the Nazis uh, began attacking, and he's actually being shot at during the, during the recording, he has to stop. It's, it's an amazing movie, it's, it's really remarkable, and, and won several Academy Awards, highly recommended. It's, it's a tough one, it's, it's, it's heavy, but uh, 
anyway, uh, if you want to hear the real Vladimir Spielman play, he actually does have a recording of this particular piece on YouTube you can, you can listen to. Um, it's also called the Reminiscence Nocturne. It was one that he actually sent in 1830 to his sister Ludwika with a dedication uh, to her saying to, he, she should uh, use it as a preparation for his second piano concerto, which is because he does a lot of quoting from that concerto. Uh, at this point, he was feeling very homesick. He's in 1830 at this point in Vienna, still trying to figure out if he's ever going to go back to Warsaw. Things are not over yet with the Russians, but it's going badly, and he's feeling a lot of that jal. He's feeling a lot of, of homesickness. So he starts, this is the only case of, of any of his music that does this, he starts quoting his own music. From the second piano concerto, we have the third movement first theme, which I will show you how that goes. Hopefully I can actually play this. So you may recognize that. Then in the nocturne we have this. So direct quotation, I'll explain a little bit why the rhythm is different in a second. Then we also have the first movement second theme, which looks like this. I think there's a, yes, I have circles. Uh, it has the sixth, uh, dotted sixth that you will hear. Here's the, the concerto. And in the nocturne. So those are there. And then we also have a song, a song called, I think it's pronounced Zichenye, which means the, or it doesn't really mean the wish, but it's entitled the wish in English. And it sounds like this. The song is like this. I will not sing it. And we have it, you know. Uh, here we go. And in the nocturne. Basically the same thing. And this introduces us to what we call the village dance theme from the last movement. Um, another one I hope I can play. Let's see here. From the concerto. Something like that. And then the... Um, left hand of the nocturne, we have this. The same thing again. Okay. Now, uh, that, that rhythm of the concerto actually is like, like we see here. This was the original version of this. He, he actually wrote in biometrical notation, which is very unusual for the time. 3-4 in the right hand, 4-4 four, four in the left hand. Now, that's a little fun to do. Let me show you a little, I'll try. See. It's, it's not normal. Um, so uh, he, he regularized this notation later in, uh, in 1836, and that is the version almost everybody plays, except for Claudio Arau. If you ever want to hear a version of the biometrical, listen to Arau's recording. Okay, I will finish the program then with the Lento con Gran Espressione, and thank you so much for coming. I will uh, hope to see you afterward outside.